I think we're actually at a crossroads. And um, we're actually living in very dangerous times at the moment. We need to be very careful where we even approach this here. <coughs> to me, what we have to do as the people is to find what our common cause actually is. We need to actually come up with a statement in response to the Yula, the Yulara statement. Because it wasn't a Yula, Yula Reed statement, it actually was Yulara within a huge multi-million tourist complex. I am not interested in giving up one form of enslavement and adopting another form of enslavement. I don't want to exist in this, co this system that we exist in today, in the sense that how we are today, we are in completely enslaved people. What happened at Uluru or Yalara actually demonstrates how, we're, how enslaved we are as a people. The so-called sovereign state give the term of reference to the referendum council and they stuck by that agenda. What happened at Yalara was predetermined. There was one road map, there was only one map with one road on that map. I'd like to see a map with a lot of roads that cover the whole country, not just North Queensland and into parts of Northern Territory, and then where the road actually, after that, sort of just disappears. And then again, it appears again from the Canberra Airport to Parliament House here. I want to fill in the rest of the roads of that map for all of our people to be a part of this, not just a very select few of well-paid. The only word I can look at at the moment is traitors. That actually described what actually happened at Galara. I'd like to come up with a statement to endorse what the people that walked out on that meeting up there, they actually asserted their sovereign right to walk away from that process up there. We as a people here, we're again asserting our sovereign rights as a people to actually meet and discuss these issues amongst ourselves. But these issues that I'd like that we are talking about, these sort of things need to be discussed with all of our people right across the country. I know that we all come from different groups and that we all tend to have our own agendas. We need to actually now come together, find a way to come together as a people. And that's what this here place actually represents, this here embassy to me. That's what this represents. We should all come together under the banner of the embassy. That's what I believe, anyhow. Because the embassy has been the only place in this country for a very long time where we can actually come and speak and speak our minds freely. It is not controlled here. Everyone that sits in this circle has a right to contribute to this discussion. We might not agree with what's being said, but they have the right to come here and express their opinion about what is going on with our lives today. This is our time. We cannot go back and live 200 years ago. We've got to live and put some sort of path to a future that actually gives our children some sort of future in our own country. Because this is still our country. This is our sovereignty has never been ceded and has never been taken away. The only way that they can actually take our, our sovereignty away from us is if we actually cede it or they completely exterminate us. We have been living under the thumb for far <coughs> too long. In actual fact, the way I said yesterday, the, actual, the way they actually treat us as a people in this country, it is actually acknowledging that we are a sovereign people. Because that's what occupiers of another people's land, that's why they treat them. 
completely under the farm. <coughs> I apologise, I've been sick with the flu and a chest infection. <coughs> <coughs> and I've been losing my voice, I apologise for that. But it's not, it does not stop my resolve. I still believe we have an opportunity here to find a way out from the mess that we live in all the time, from the squalor that we live in from this disunity that we live with all the time and the fear, the constant fear of reprisal from these people that supposedly control all of our lands and all of our resources. I do not want to pass that fear onto my children and our grandchildren and their children. We want to live where we did over 200 years ago as a free and independent people. We have the right to our own resources and the means to support ourselves. This country is a very rich country, one of the most richest countries in the world, yet we live in fourth world conditions. It is only because, in a lot of ways, because we still allow that to happen to us because we've become so divided as a people. <clears throat> to me, we have to come to find a way to actually unite ourselves, to come under the one banner, even if it's only for a small period of time that we come together and stand together. I know that we have all these organisations. I'm not against that. But we need to come together under one banner just for a small amount of time because that'll make these people up there fucking good in themselves. And I cannot just sit back sit on the sideline and watch what is going on. To do that is admitting and it is an admission of self-defeat as far as I'm concerned. I'm not going to be a passenger in this and watch this unfold around us. It is time for us to actually stand up and be counted. Not just to talk the talk, we all got to start walk the walk too. But we walk together as a people. If nothing else that comes out of this, it is that thing that I say is unity. Let's bring our people together for a while. For once in this fucking, to last 200 years, let's come together as one people for a while. That could possibly change everything in this country. We are not going to get what we want, but we do not stop demanding that day, what we want as a people, because <coughs> that is our birthright. It is a fucking maze we have entered into. We have been treated like rats in a maze, but there is a way out of that maze. We just have to find it. And we start on that process here today. And I would like to hand over to Michael now because I'm just losing my voice. Thank you. Thanks, Uncle. My name's Les Coe. I've been involved in this here thing about constitutional recognition for quite a little while now and speaking at a number of forums. I also found out about the Dubbo Dialogue by accident. I saw a web page. I rang up. Prime Minister and Cabinet, and I wanted to know where the meeting was going to be held at Dubbo because I had intended to go to it. They, already, they told me that invitations had already been sent out. And I said, when were they sent out? And they said they were sent out a few weeks back. And I said, well, I want to know how you get onto that list. 
They started to get, they called me back. I got a phone call three days before the Dubbo meeting, dialogue. Said that I can, they issued me with an invitation to go to the Dubbo dialogue. I wanted to know what the agenda was at the Dubbo dialogue. They said, no, you got to go to the Dubbo dialogue to find that out. And I was saying, what's going on here? What's, what's all the secrecy about? Just an open meeting or a closed meeting like this. Anyhow, I went to the Dubbo, where 100 people were invited to attend that, with a number of conveners. Now, probably just as many conveners as people that were invited there. I posed the question at, at that dialogue, why is this, why are we having secret meetings like this? We're talking about constitutional recognitions. This should be open meetings for all Aboriginal people to actually attend this, to at least have the opportunity to come along to these meetings and put their point of view across. Talking about New South Wales Land Council, Roy RC actually got up in that meeting and said this has got nothing to do with the State Land Council, even though the State Land Council's Deputy Chair and a lot of their staff were actually at that dialogue. The Deputy Chair was actually <coughs> convening the meeting. Roy was there with a few of his um, regional councillors. What was his name, the Deputy Chair? Uh, she. Oh. Um, Dennis, uh, Anne Dennis, from Walligan. People that I went there with, my daughter was there, my sister was there, Lyle was there. Well, the issue that we wanted to put on the table was sovereignty and treaty. We weren't just interested in constitutional recognition as the government proposed what they wanted to do. Also, with the um, Referendum Council, they've had a long time to actually pull this together. And that's part of the problem that we had. Well, I certainly had that we only had three days to consider this. But they were demanding that we put a vote on it, just be the rubber stamp for them. And let them do what they wanted to do. Well, I was quite against that. This should be an open meeting for everyone to actually come to. I also said at that meeting in Dubbo that because of this here meeting, the way it's been conducted, that we reserve the right to actually withdraw from this process at any time because this has been done under GRS. We want to know, we want to be able to come to this dialogue, take out from this dialogue, take it back to our people and discuss it amongst ourselves. We also want to talk to our own legal people. I don't care what the government's lawyers and that are saying. I want to talk to our legal people, our experts, not just their so-called experts. I'd actually challenge them to a debate their experts. I call them a bunch of halfwits because of what they've come up with in the sense of just sticking us in the constitution and changing the little things like that's actually benefit government by taking out a clause, section 23 or 25, that stops people from actually casting a vote in state elections. What that actually says about the Constitution says it's actually a racist document. Mm -hmm. Now, this year government and all Australian governments never pull that Constitution out. They don't take it around and pass it around like, here, yeah, have a look at this, you know, this, uh, keep it well hidden. Because of the very fact it's a racist bloody document. To cut a long story short, they elected delegates at the dialogue in Dubbo. I was one of the delegates to go to Uluru. My daughter was an one. Lyle was an one, and several other people. I drove up to Uluru, drove the five and a half thousand kilometres up there. My daughter went on the plane and she confirmed what was being said here. They actually chartered flights to fly people from all over Australia up there. They said at the Dubbo dialogue that they didn't have any money to do, to do what we wanted them to do and actually convene a meeting for everyone. 
State Land Council, Roy RC, said that the State Land Council has got no money, that this has not got, lots, again, got nothing to do with it. But what we said to the State Land Council, that what we wanted used to do was actually hire buses so people could actually go to the little room. But Roy was, didn't want nothing to do with that. Roy's only interested in what's in his own wallet. Oh, yeah, I see. Oh, can I say, did they say at the Dubbo one, because at the Sydney one, right up the front of, um, they set their housekeeping rules and, you yes. know, no thing, and Pat Anderson goes, um, um, there is no going back to consult with your communities. Yep. The decisions taken at Uluru are final, and that was, what, three, four weeks later. So, um, any decisions made at Uluru are final. There's no more consultation with your communities. Did they say that at, yeah, to you? They basically said that. But that's what we were saying. We, well, we don't care about what your agenda is. If we want to take this back to our own people and discuss this before it goes any further. Because we don't have the mandate from our mob to actually go to Dubbo and vote on it. I did not, did not even have the mandate from my own community to actually go to Dubbo and vote on their behalf. Same thing was at Uluru. Now, as soon as I pulled up at Uluru on Tuesday afternoon, I was being threatened straight away by people there at Uluru that were there. I mean threatened, physically going to be bashed, going to be speared. Were you there, Lisa? Yes, I was there. That process continued for the duration that I was there, constant being threatened all the time. You're not allowed to talk here. I don't know what I'm talking about. That if I speak up, that I was going to be speared. That process, of course, I didn't react to it. They actually then focused on my daughter, started threatening her. We told the Referendum Council about this, the threats that were, were, that were being directed towards us. We weren't interested, didn't want to know about it. The delegates at that dialogue, they break us all up into little groups. The conveners at the front, any time a delegate said anything, the conveners turned it into a short little sentence that was generally nonsensical, didn't make any sense. What I said at that dialogue, or the, the uh, Uluru meeting, was that we need some sort of protection against government, their agents and their institutions' excesses towards us and their attitudes towards us. But if it diminishes our sovereignty, we are not interested in it. Our sovereignty yep. lives and breathes yep. because they have not exterminated us. And what we want, the Radjuri people, because my daughter and I went to the Radjuri Council of Elders and got a mandate from the Radjuri Council of Elders to be able to speak for them at Uluru. What I said at that thing is what we want is what the same thing government wants, and that's certainty. Everything else is not negotiable. If it's, we don't get certainty, we'll stick it up your ass. Not interested in it. Now, if you want to know what certainty is, it's about what this lady over is talking about, our culture, our identity be able to practice who we are. Our lands actually belong to us, cannot be taken off us at any stage by a stroke of a pen up here in government. That they stop stealing our kids. All the stuff that we want to talk about, that we actually be allowed to be who we are. Well, I am Radri. I'm actually Radri Nunnawal. This is my mother's country right here. That's to me what this is all about. But that agenda that the Referendum Council has, they just expected us to show up there and be a rubber stamp. I actually walked out of that meeting before the other people walked out earlier on, later on in the day. After they walked out of that meeting, threats were being made to people within that group, especially the younger ones. Yep. And the threats were to kill them, not just to bash them, 
but to actually kill them, spear them and kill them. Well, I said, I don't give a fuck about your threats. You can spear me if you like, I don't care. It's not going to stop us from doing what we have to do. I agree with what Marjorie says here. I came here for a meeting to actually form a statement from the people that were at Uluru. Now, I thought this meeting that we came down here for was going to be on tomorrow, on the 24th. Yeah. So did the other people from the delegates that went to Uluru that walked out. That's what the decision we made there at Uluru, to have the meeting here on the 24th. Yeah. We want to actually make a statement, put it out, to counteract what the referendum council's coming up with. Of course, they're just rubber stamping it. What they're actually doing, I need a drink of water, but what they're actually doing, most of those people that were there were actually looking after their own interest. In a sense, a lot of those people are well-paid Aboriginal people and they've been in those positions for a very long time. And they were there, as far as I'm concerned, to make sure that they're in a position of power to maintain that power base for mm -hmm. them and get make a living out of the rest of us, mm -hmm. while the rest of us live in shit. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Happens with mental health too. That's why we got We can all know what's Twice. going on in this country, how they keep stealing our kids. We all know all the Dondale centres right across the country. They want to kill the abo in the child. To me, that's what they are endorsing at Uluru. Lyle Munro actually got up there at Uluru and said he wanted to move a motion that the government cease the intervention. The majority of people actually up there shouted Lyle down and voted for the continuation of the intervention. And they people up the there people. actually reckon that a lot of the inter intervention was only in the Northern Territory. Well, that's bullshit. The intervention is spreading right across the country. This affects all of us in one way or another. But that's only just one part of what's going on, the intervention, where it's controlling our incomes. If you're on the dole or your pension, they control your income. That's what this intervention is about. Also, when they brought the intervention in, they changed the land, the land tenure system in the Northern Territory. What it did was make land rights in the Northern Territory a lot weaker land tenure system. To me, that's what this is all about. Taking the little bit of land, a little bit of culture that we still maintain and own, our own identity, and actually destroy the lot to continue the assimilation of all of our people right across the country. Mm -hmm. To me, this is what's going on, is the final nail in the coffin. Yes. <laughs> we go down this road that they want to take us down, push us down, force us down, we will never come back from no. it as a people. No. It'll be all over. That's yeah. it. We will be completely Finished. consumed within the wider Australian population. Mm -hmm. Government has had this process in place for a long time. They call it absorption, where we will be absorbed within the rest of the population. That's why they want to continue with this immigration policy. They want to make sure that there are so many non-Aboriginal people in this country that we will never be in a position, we'll never have the power to actually take back what is rightfully ours. Our sovereignty is alive and well because we all live. That is legitimate. What they have is just power. They have the power of the gun, the police force, and they're still killing us today. I want to do what's been mentioned here already. I actually would like to call a meeting of all nations right across the country and have it here. Yes like we're doing now, yes. in a circle. In warm weather. Yes, in warmer weather. <laughs> but I'm also concerned that time may not be on our side. Yes. Time, yeah, we're running out of time. The, the, the referendum council is going to present their findings to government on the 30th of this month. That's the end, that's next week. I also believe we got to also come together as a people. 
mm. like they did in Victoria, where 50,000 people closed Melbourne down. Yeah, that's right. We've got to have 50,000, 100,000 people here and close Canberra down. Mm. That won't happen overnight, but we've got to work towards it. Yep. And we never cede our sovereign right, our right to be us, our right to have our resources to support and sustain ourselves. We want to live under our own banner and even in the sense of our own laws where we can. We, I've done it in my own community with my own sons, nephews, have actually taken them back through law. I was put through law, Wiradjuri law, and I want to pass that on to my grandchildren. That is who we are as a people. That is the law of the land. This other law is an imported law. It is not even actually British law. It is actually an admiralty law. Well, the law of the sea have been statements made by Noel Pearson. Pat Anderson and Megan Davis, they're going to target the embassy. Yes. Put it in concrete. Yes. Put they're going to in. target this embassy because this is the only place we actually have a free voice. Yeah. Every other voice in Australia, whether we like it or not, Aboriginal is controlled by government. Yes. Yeah. They control the purse strings, they control the voice. Yes. They do not control that ear. Yeah. 